Hello, and welcome to Benjamin Boyce's Channels. Today's guest is Megan Dom, who is a prolific and constant writer and commenter on the public discourse writ large, popular culture, politics, and other interesting issues that she comes up with ideas to talk about. She has been in the writing industry for, I think, is fair to say 25 years since she graduated from college, and she just recently published a book, I guess a couple months ago, called The Problem With Everything which is a very fun, fascinating discourse with herself about the state that we are in right now with regards to what we can and can't say and the tensions between being an authentic voice and putting on a lot of artifice in order to get your internet points. This is very Gen x a very Gen x episode to add to my podcast list. I know you're going to love it. Without further ado, here's Megan Dom, author. Hi. Professor, are you profusing right now? Profusing? I don't know where that came from. Am I, am I profess profusing to you right now? No, I don't. I don't think so. So don't worry. I, I do. I do many things. So I. I guess teach. I do. I teach in many capacities. I guess professing is one of them. But are, are you? Because I know in in the book the problem with everything, which is uh, what Stephen Hawking would have wrote on a very tetchy day. Um, <laughs> Wow. You, you talk yeah. about being a, a teacher, so I'm wondering, yeah. is that one of your gigs right now? Or? Yeah, so I'm on the uh, adjunct faculty at Columbia University in the graduate oh. uh, writing program in the School of the Arts, um, which I'm actually a graduate of myself. I, I'm an alum. I went there about 25 years ago. Uh, so I, I teach there, and I also do private workshops out of my apartment here in New York. And in the book, I... I talk about uh, being at the University of Iowa, and that's because I was a uh, visiting, I had a visiting professorship for a semester, uh, and that's part of the semester I was working on the book. So, and and that. while you're teaching, you're writing too. You're always doing these columns oh, yeah. and essays. You think? Yeah. So I'm a so I'm a freelan I've been a freelancer my whole career, so I'm always doing all sorts of things. Um, yeah, I, I I was a I've always been a like a magazine writer. I started off in the early nineties writing for magazines. Uh, and I would do everything from like serious essays to cultural criticism to like 10 tips, uh, women's magazine style pieces. And those were the <laughs> ones that paid. So I did a lot of those. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I've written several books and I was a newspaper opinion columnist for over 10 years at the Los Angeles Times. So, yeah, just always cobbling it together. And uh, You were a grifter before it was a bad thing to be. Is, that, is, is, grif is, is this grifter just mean, like, a uh, person who needs to pay the rent? Or, like, or no, that's a rent seeker. Excuse me. I, I'm, I'm unclear what rent, rent seeker is, like, a new, is it, it's, the la it's the latest. The, that's a Weinstein. I, I think uh, the, the elder Weinstein uh, popularized that. Uh, rent seeker yeah. is somebody who's just trying to get a place in the economy where they don't have to add anything of value. They just take okay. other people's rent. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, no, because I never, I, I was never able to collect enough rent to call myself a, a rent seeker. That, that would, that would imply that you're actually making money. No, I'm a, I'm, I'm a freelancer. I'm a self-employed person. And I am, you know, I think that's actually, we don't have to get into this right off the bat, but I think that's one reason I'm able to sort of take on these subjects is because to the, to the extent that anyone is uncancelable, uh, it helps to not rely on a single source of income. I have many, many uh, different different ways that I support myself. So if, if a couple places decide they don't want me anymore, yeah. it's not going to be the end of me. The chickens have to come to many roosts before you're yeah. Yeah. out to dry. Yes. Not, that it's, not that it's impossible, but it's less likely. It's harder, harder to get them to come to a bunch of places. Does that uh, also affect the kind of the way in which your brain finds topics to talk about? Do you, do you feel like you're kind of one one phrase that uh, is kind of semi popular now is politically homeless? But being yeah. being in between all these different institutions, is, have you always been kind of the uh, not outsider but in betweener kind of? Um. Yeah, I think I've been sort of neither fish nor fowl. That might be a way to say it. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's but it, it was never really relevant, and it certainly wasn't like um, anything that was 
a problem until the last couple of years. You know, my my approach to writing has always been uh, to observe the culture, observe the world and, um, you know, be honest about my own thoughts and opinions and sort of look at the places where hmm. the, the kind of mainstream opinion or sort of conventional wisdom is maybe um, hypocritical or not seeing the whole picture or not telling the whole story and, and really approaching my, my work from, from that place. Like, you know, I would say like, this is something I've noticed in the world. This is the way people are talking about it. But in looking at it closely, I actually think that what's really going on is this. Now, uh, up until a few years ago, that was just, uh, that was just the way that uh, a person who was a professional writer or thinker went about their work. <laughs> that, that was the job. Uh, so I never really, I, I, I saw myself as willing to be controversial, but I did not see myself as controversial in and of myself. Uh, and I think that's that's changed a lot. Um, and so, you know, to, to, it's, it's another cliche to say, like, I haven't changed, uh, but the world has. Um, yeah. But in this case, I think it's true. I've, I've really um, not changed my approach at all. Well, uh, this is a really big question. And I think you, you try to wrestle with it in your book. But what happened? What, what happened in the, the last half decade? Yeah, it started the, around the, the 2014. The stakes of controversy right? became yeah. all of a sudden. Um, I, I think that yeah, I started noticing it around 2014 uh, it, it, on Twitter. You know, so, social media really came around and sort of took this. The, the, the group psychology really became um, a stand-in for, for personal psychology and, and just sort of individual uh, original thought. So I think it was, it's people just sort of stopped having the time or taking the time to actually think about what they thought. And so they just went to the defaults that they were seeing on social media. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not the say, first to say this, and obviously um, it, it came before Trump. I mean, Trump is a symptom of this, not the cause. But I think that we started to have, something started to morph about public discourse and public opinion and thinking itself. And it just kind of built and built. And then Trump came along and suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, we can't afford to, to, uh, to, to, to critique certain norms. And we cannot, we cannot afford, the left cannot afford to think critically about itself uh, because we need all hands on deck and we're in such an emergency state that uh, we've got one message and it's hashtag resistance. And uh, there's no room for any sort of uh, wandering off into other pastures to think about these things. Like we, we cannot afford to have sort of nuanced conversations because we're in this state of emergency. And, you know, I would argue that that's one of the, the biggest casualties of this, of this administration. It's, you know, obviously there's all sorts of, you know, political norms being obliterated and he's, you know, doing all kinds of damage in all kinds of ways. But uh, I, I think that what, ha what he has caused or what he has allowed otherwise smart, thoughtful, critical thinking people to do in terms of laziness of their own discourse, um, it's potentially catastrophic. Yeah, it's that potent cocktail of laziness and urgency that yeah. is the collapse of, of critical thought. of Right, and, and just... Thought. The, I mean, the incentive for saying the obvious thing is so great. You know, you can go on social media and if you say the thing that everyone else is thinking, um, mm -hmm. but maybe in a, in a more extreme way or, you know, there's, I mean, there's actually like studies, I'm sure you're familiar with them. There's, there's data, there's studies showing that if you, you know, use certain words that express outrage or connote anger, you know, you're much more likely to get a big response and get likes and retweets. And there's a dopamine hit that comes along with that. So, so the incentive just to be obvious and to be ham-fisted uh, is really huge. And the disincentive to say anything original is also huge because you, you risk not only being ignored, but being, but being penalized, right? So if you say, try to say something complicated, um, you're likely to be willfully misconstrued. And the penalties for that are, are huge, as we know. Well, what does it feel like for you when you say something that's obvious? Oh, like disgusting. Like th this is why it's, I, I cannot say uh, it, it, I'm like allergic to, 
to saying something obvious. It makes me feel completely uh, disingenuous. You know, this was what the pro- this is why I was so I was a opinion columnist for all those years. And, you know, I, I loved it in a lot of ways, but it was really hard because I didn't want to weigh in on anything unless I was going to find something to say that, that somebody else hadn't said, like, otherwise it was just, I just felt like a fraud, you know, I like, why am I wasting my time? And, you know, I, I might've set myself up for failure or just made it harder for myself because, you know, obviously being a newspaper columnist, especially if you have to write like two or three times a week, there is no way you can do it without saying something obvious. And, you know, most columnists, they develop the, uh, their own obvious thing and they just kind of keep saying the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I, I have a version of that too. But uh, no, I, I don't really see the point of just, you know, uh, saying how much Trump sucks every day. I mean, th- th- this, this should be clear. <laughs> If, if we if we are still uh, if you still have any doubt that I or or you know any other thinking person uh, hates Trump and thinks he sucks, I don't know what to say to you. Uh, so I just I I I really want to be able to like get past that sort of throat clearing and and say something new. But um, it's become difficult because just frankly, we don't have the space, we don't have the bandwidth to okay. uh, to to make it to to raise a complicated point and and uh, make the argument uh, in a coherent way. And uh, we, don't have, uh, we don't have editors helping us and we don't have readers uh, having the attention span to read a big thing. And so it's just, we've, here we are. In, in your journey as a writer, um, and I, I guess I should frame this in, in my own experience, uh, being an, a young writer, I was always trying to say something original, but now that I'm kind of getting into that naturally more and more conservative phase of life, you know, going through like into my <laughs> mid forties and like um. what, what I'm trying to do is, is more about getting to first principles, like building that first principle, which is there's a different relationship between the obvious and, and the basic, like, <laughs> right. Yes. Do, 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 I'm trying to craft a question, but like, how do you, how do you approach like the profound, which is not going to be new necessarily? Yeah. The, uh, there's a big, I love the, the, the obvious versus the basic. I mean, it w- reminds me of like, is it in Annie Hall, you know, Woody Allen, he talks about the, the horrible versus the miserable. So, you know, the, these are the two choices in life, you know, that there's the horrible, which is like, acute trauma, uh, you know, being, being tortured or, you know, made your, your life being, uh, you know, suffering on just a daily basis. That's the horrible. And then the miserable is just kind of like a, a baseline dissatisfaction. <laughs> so, you know, you want to choose the miserable. So I guess, so if we're going to, uh, extrapolate from there, so the basic versus the obvious, um, I guess I would see it as the, the, maybe it's like, the basic i mean you don't want to say the obvious thing um and i guess i mean i don't know this is really interesting i guess you would build from a, a basic place i mean it's funny because the worst thing you can call somebody these days is, is a basic right yeah right the yeah. basic bitch is the worst thing you can be and so uh to to have a to make a basic point i mean i, I guess it's sort of like you start from a place of rationality like you start from a place of honesty. I think, you know, you've got to, you know, it's like, you can't, you can't talk about how to fix things uh, unless we agree on what's true. Right. So I guess you start from a place of truth of like, let's have a, some kind of, um, you know, set of standardized criteria uh, in, that we can use to evaluate what is true versus false. What is real versus not real. Mm-hmm. There. I wonder if in, in some respects, I don't know if you say this explicitly or not in the book, but there's a section in the book, which I think was published before the book came out, uh, about your, your love affair with the IDW or like Fast Times and ID, <laughs> IDW High. Right? Nuance, a love story. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it, I wonder if what attracted you to the conversations that were being had and are still having, and maybe we're even having one right now, was the way in which they were burrowing down to f- first principles or, or approaching yeah. like a, a level playing field or a, a state of truth or honesty or the way in which they're getting to that. Right. Well, some of them were not all of them, of course. So, right. That, um, the way that essay came to be, it was, it was a little bit circuitous. Um, 
I was, was I even, yeah, I was trying to write the book, but you know, the book had many iterations. We can talk about that in a minute if you want. I mean, initially it was going to be much more around issues of feminism and, and kind of women, yeah. the way, the way women sort of uh, have, be, you know, womanhood has become an identity category. So it was about that. Um, but then, you know, I had just in my life, I was, I was going, I was getting divorced and I was um, just kind of in this mode where I didn't have, uh, I, I didn't have anyone to really talk to about a lot of these issues. I mean, my husband, for all of our problems, he had really been my intellectual ally and we really talked about ideas all the time and it was um, sustaining, you know, he, he was, he was, you know, the person, you know, we, we, we talked about constantly, like, what is the problem with everything? Like we were constantly just talking about what was the problem with everything. And so uh, I, I, we, I lost that, you know, we split up and I left California and I moved to New York and I found myself, uh, you know, as my, my real life friends were sort of slowly drifting into this kind of what would later be called wokeness or they were just um and again well before trump but there was this kind of mounting uh, uh rhetoric that had to do with uh sort of reductive ideas about social justice and identity politics and people were sort of i, I was noticing that the window was closing in terms of what people were willing to talk about the very same people who used to talk about everything so i found myself like watching a lot of youtube videos and yeah. it started off with John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry on, on blogging heads. And I still think that's, that's the best show in town. I mean, those conversations between the two of them are better than really and anybody in this space, I would say this IDW space, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I just kind of, the algorithm then just kind of took me down uh, the so-called rabbit hole. And, and I started getting really interested in people having these conversations. And yes, so it became, so that was part of the book. And uh, I wasn't going to pull it out as a separate essay, but then, you know, around somehow around 2018, everyone started talking about the IDW. And I said, oh my gosh, like I've been, I, I've been into this stuff way before anybody else has. So I want to say something about this. So I, I sort of uh, turned that section of the book into a freestanding essay and um, it, it ended up in, in medium. And by the way, it, the reason it was in medium was because none of the mainstream uh, publications would, uh, would run it. So uh, do you know <laughs> you why, go. or do you have any, uh, I why? Just think there is um, a real, a real just sort of wariness about some of the people I was mentioning. And I mean, okay. it's, there's, ju there's just, a, and, and these were all publications that I've written for, for years um and yeah. there's just a there's a real um sort of ideological stranglehold going on um, is it is it ideal is it ideological is it also kind of business related like legacy media wanting to maintain its gatekeeping um capacity or yes i, I talk, think it is it? i think it is that but it's it's interesting because legacy media uh you know w when i was coming up was was about having the complicated conversations. I mean, the people running, running the show were the mm -hmm. ones who were sort of more, uh, more sophisticated or more sort of intellectually risk-taking than the average person in the world. And now it's completely flipped the other way around. And I do think it's a business model. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole structure of publishing uh, and, and media, certainly print media has, has collapsed, you know, it's just, just no, there's no revenue stream. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really difficult to, uh, the, the only way it sort of works to be a kind of opinion-y essay-ish kind of writer is to write multiple hot takes a, a day. And, and that really yeah. precludes any kind of, um, sophisticated thought <laughs> for the most part. Ha have you thought anything about, uh, have you thought much about, uh, kind of the way in which it seems like we're going into an oral tradition when it comes to intellectual discourse now yeah. from, from the written to the oral and how that changes the dynamics of uh, how thoughts manifest. And Yes. So, I mean, the pot, yeah. And then getting back to your earlier question, I, part of the, the appeal, I think of those YouTube conversations and, you know, I would watch them, I guess I had a lot of time on my hand. I wasn't always listening to them. I would sit there and watch them uh, was that they were going on for hours you know, yeah. we, we had on one hand, you know, anything you were reading, uh, you know, in, in print or online media was just very short, even places like National Public Radio, very short. Uh, 
obviously to help cable news shorter than short, but you had like suddenly these people having two hour, three hour long conversations and it was exhilarating. So I think, yes, I think that we are for better or worse, for worse, moving away from, um, from sort of long form, uh, mm-hmm. written word to talking. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure I would call it oral. Tradi- it's funny. I never thought of it as an oral tradition, I guess, like technically that's true, but, um, I, I think it, it's definitely people sitting around having conversations. But you know, look, I mean, I want to be clear. I think that there's excellent long form reporting going on. I, I don't want to diss. I'm not going to sit here and like diss. No, no. Yeah. Um, but where's the know. audience's attention? Where's yeah, it going? I mean, there's excellent, you know, certainly there's incredibly important news reporting, interna- international reporting, political reporting going on. Um, you know, there are still amazing long essays being written. I guess my, my point is that they are being oversaturated by really short kind of empty calorie yeah. kind of stuff. And so people are sort of finding their way um, into the, into the podcast arena. And, and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the place where you can kind of just think out loud and, yeah. um, and not get, uh, not get in trouble for it yet. Although if that, that's going so to <laughs> yeah, start to happen. That's going to start to happen. Yeah. Um, what do you think about uh, – just as an, as an example, when the Evergreen fiasco happened, the way that the legacy media reported it was right. very interesting. And it's kind of integral to how things unfolded because only Fox would talk to Brett Weinstein. Right, yes. Um, because the, the all the other – you know, the because the, it, it didn't – it might not have jived. No, with they didn't their... know how to make sense of it. It was like they couldn't yeah. like get their minds around it. I think the Wall Street Journal was the first to do. They some they, somebody wrote like an op-ed, right, opinion piece in the yeah. journal. Yeah. Melicor, I believe. Um, yeah. And so, what happens when the legacy media decides to not report something that's happening? And and what what is the role of you know the grassroots media in in challenging the structure of deciding not only who can speak but what is what fits in the narrative, what doesn't fit in there, how to how to make sense of it? And and do, do you have do you, is that something that that draws you when you see a story that 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 other people aren't covering or something? Does that? Yeah. And, but I mean, in a way, it's really no different. I mean, there have always been stories that the mainstream media covers yeah. and stories that they ignore. It's just the nat- it's just what are, what do those stories tend to be? So you know, once upon a time, mainstream media wasn't covering a lot of stories that had to do with with racial injustice or or yeah. you know yeah. all sorts of you know yeah. just if if it wasn't kind of you know right in their face as affecting the sort of you know corporate sphere or you know, white, the middle, upper middle class, they weren't going to notice yeah. it. So that, so it was the job of grassroots media, okay. alternative, you know, alternative publications to go out and get those stories. So that that's always been the case. But what's different now is that, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the sensibility of, of the left um, and in many cases of the progressive, you know, far left, progressive, whatever you want to call it, that's the default setting of the mainstream and media. So, um, if something is running counter narrative to their sort of like, you know, kind of reductive notions of social justice, then they don't know what to do with it. But I think we're in a really, um, pivotal moment because what we don't want is to have to rely on like the right wing media. We don't want to like give the right wing media the sort of like, you know, imprimatur of, of, grassroots or you know fighting the fight or s- telling the untold story because hmm. they're probably going to get it wrong too um so I, I i'm like really excited for a kind of like um a whole other you know sort of middle ground i don't know what you want to call it to to emerge just a sort of like you know e- ethos of of nuance and critical thinking and heterodoxy that that has nothing to do with e- either of these or, or, or incorporates the best of both sides. And, and just How do you s- foresee that forming and, and becoming kind of uh, standardized or institutionalized in, or in a positive no, sense? A known option. I don't know. It's something I've been thinking about. Uh, you know, my, the book has only been out for, for a couple of months really. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's been fascinating. It was, it was incredibly difficult to write the book. I mean, just so your audience knows it's called the problem with everything. And it's about, you know, it, it's it's a lot of it is about the sort of um, hypocrisy mm. around the the rhetoric around the women's movement and this kind of weird, yeah. strange contradiction of like women have 
it's never been a better time to be a woman. And yet the, uh, the discourse around it would suggest that it's never been a worse time to be a woman. <laughs> so, so what do we do with that? So there was that, but then, you know, more broadly, the, the book is just about this kind of uh, conversational chokehold that we find ourselves in. And so, so, you know, I, when I finally finished the book, I went out on tour with it. It came out. Um, it was very, very harshly criticized in really? um, mainstream elite media. Oh yeah. The New Yorker absolutely, you know, was trashed in, I don't know. Really? I, I, you know, yeah. I, I think trashed is a fair word. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they thought they interpreted it as, um, my just being an older, you know, Gen X rolling her eyes at millennials. Um, yeah, there, there were okay. not, it, it was, it was, you know, and I should, there were some very thoughtful, fair reviews. So don't get me wrong, but yeah, no, notably the, the New Yorker, um, the new Republic, uh, you know, all places I've written for before and all places that like fully embraced me, you know, for my last five books. <laughs> and, you know, I I've been in, you know, in their good graces for decades. Um, and now it was sort of decided that this book was an indictment of uh, wokeness and therefore an indictment of empathy, um, a sort of uh, just, um, a, 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 you know, just a, a sort of screed against political correctness. So it was really, re you know, the, the very point that I was making in the book was then remade <laughs> by the, by a lot of the people criticizing the book. And so it was entirely predictable. Um, I wasn't surprised at all that that was the reaction, but, but what, you know, and this gets back to what you were asking, I think in going out and being on book tour and, and, you know, experiencing this, this divide between the, the media response and real people on the ground and their response, it was profound. I mean, I would get like annihilated in some review and then that night go and do an event at a bookstore and people would be like packed in there. They'd be dying to talk. They would be saying, hmm. thank you for expressing this. And these were like not conservatives. These were college professors and lawyers and, you know, people living in Seattle going to a bookstore in Capitol Hill. Like this, you know, it, it's, it's so clear that uh, we need some kind of um, movement or that's a grandiose way of saying it, but th there really yeah. needs to be um, a way of, of talking about things uh, in an honest, in, in an honest fashion that, that grants issues their complexity because it's not being offered. Um, it's not being offered in most of the media at this point. A very cynical take that I've, I admit to having sometimes is that certain institutions are, are captured and there's no way around it. But maybe there's going to be a change. Maybe, maybe the gap between the, the tower and you know, the street will somehow rectify itself. And uh, this is kind of an odd um, example, but it seems that there's a lot of changes in Disney because of the direction that they went with their their Star Wars, which was very, mm -hmm. I, I think you could probably fairly say it was rather woke, woke in Star certain Wars, respects, yeah. right? Um, yeah. It seems like there will be a market correction, but do, do you, uh, the Academy and I think certain... Uh, parts of the media are insulated from the market correction, it, but correct me if I'm wrong. Do you think? Well, uh, you mean they're insulated, like insofar as they don't make any money anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's well, at least with the academy, <laughs> like that's <laughs> right. Oh, I yeah. I mean, do you I'll... do you trust the market to correct this? Right. <laughs> oh, I guess <laughs> I'm. A, I, uh, I trust the market more than I trust um, the current uh, institutional gatekeepers. I mean, I, I think mm. that there are, you know, the, the people who are uh, writing the Twitter headlines and the people who are, uh, you know, writing, writing op-eds and assigning op-eds and then places like the New York Times uh, and, and, you know, de deciding what's the story on, on NPR, th that is a tiny, tiny tiny uh sector of society i mean that's like a tiny fraction of people who major in humanities who go to liberal arts colleges who go to four-year colleges who go to college at all i mean this is a very very thin slice of of the populace um and i don't think that uh i i i, I think that there's going to have to be some sort of course correction because i mean look what's happened look what's happening now with the with the democratic primary i mean 
it's we 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 can't get ourselves sorted out like <laughs> like nobody mm. is really representing um mm. uh most liberals and it's funny that bernie you know bernie sanders is now ahead uh and i i suspect it's because he's really the only uh the only one who wasn't pandering to sort of woke semantics in a certain way i mean elizabeth warren mm. I don't know. I, I used to give her the well, benefit of the doubt and say, like, whoever's doing her Twitter, it like has it in for her because th- this is not, you know, tweeting that, that that trans, that, you know, trans women of color are the backbone of the Democratic Party. Uh, you got to be kidding me! Did she? Did, I, I don't believe Elizabeth Warren wrote that. You know, uh, some twenty-three-year-old did who works for her. But now, but then she's going around saying these things, like you know, mm-hmm. live, you know, coming right out of her mouth. So who knows? Um, but I, I just think it's pretty indicative of the of the limited shelf life of this that we have somebody like Elizabeth Warren, who, in my opinion, is vastly more qualified than Bernie Sanders, maybe even at anybody up there. I mean, I don't agree with all of her policies, but it's pretty it's pretty mm. stunning to see her fall so far behind someone like Bernie Sanders. And I think one of the reasons is that she she kind of bought into the idea that you had to pander to the kind of uh, woke rhetoric and, and he has just refused to, and he's being rewarded for it and she's being punished. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you, what, why do you think that it is attractive The What you just said is woke rhetoric. Uh, what, what is attractive about that? Is it well, because you, once you buy in, it's obvious all the different things you need to say it's or young and cool. Like it's attractive. I think that, you know, her advice, it's attractive to the, the, her advisors who are, of that demographic it's it's attractive to people who are on twitter because it's what gets you uh leverage on twitter it, you know okay. it's, it's yeah. you know if it's attractive because if, if you can go uh you know on twitter and say something a, about um a, a marginalized uh, group uh that that lifts them up and beats yourself down for being privileged you're going to get a lot of likes and it's going to make you feel good. <laughs> so it's attractive the way taking a hit of a drug is attractive, but um, mm-hmm. it doesn't pay off in the end. It, it'll hmm. bite you in the butt in the end. So I think that we're, I think that we are going to see that. I think that, you know, even back in 2000, you know, 2016, 2017, I was saying to people, you know, I, I, I know it seems like everything is about this, um, you know, this, this social justice, you know, and, and again, I, I'm all for social justice. So when I'm using terms like that, I'm talking about the sort of, um, capital S, capital the, 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 yeah, the sort of commodification of social justice. You know, it, it seems like everybody's really excited about, uh, about speaking this way and standing up for, um, yeah. people who haven't been included and, and in a very sort of overcorrective way, it seems like it's exciting, but you know what? People are getting really sick of it. People were getting really sick of it by 2017, even probably before that. And it just has taken a while to catch on. And a lot of that is because Trump has made it so that, um, you know, it's, we're, we're, everything is so terrible uh, that, that we can't possibly... Um, just be we, miserable, goddammit. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, he's really, it's like, you know, I, part, of the, part of the Trump derangement is that he's sort of, t- whatever you were upset about before, he has just amplified it and politicized it. So, you know, maybe you just used to be upset about the way animals were treated. And now yeah. you can be upset about the way animals were treated in this like big way that, that Trump, you know, it's about how everybody is treated and how, you know, we live in a completely inhumane society huh. and there are babies in cages and like, oh my God, everything is falling apart. Eh. Yes and no, (laughs) but but now you have a mission. Now you're not just you know on your hobby horse. Now now it's relevant. And it's gotten really really it's gotten really really mixed up. And uh, you know and it's it's and it's very hard to even make a point like that without people saying, "Wow, you must be coming from some some such a place of privilege that you don't see." the harm people are experiencing on a day-to-day basis. It's, 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 then it immediately goes to that. And How do you rebut that? How do you that. rebut claims of privilege and, and you're okay boomer and all that stuff? I mean, I guess I, I would, you know, just say it's like, you know, am I, if people would say like, well, you, you wrote this whole book about how, you know, women aren't really necessarily as bad off as you might uh, infer from, from Twitter. <laughs> 
And that's because you're like a white privileged feminist. And, you know, I guess I would say like, I, you know, I, I am speaking as a, a privileged white person because that's what I am. But I'm also speaking as someone with a certain kind of bullshit detector. And I don't think yeah. any particular identity group has a monopoly on bullshit detection. In fact, it's it's bigoted to, to say so. So really, I think most people, uh, most people can see through it. I, I really think most people can see through it. It's just a matter of reaching a point where um, it's it's safe to say that you're seeing through it. Okay. Yeah. In 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 your book, you, you talk about one of your internships was at a fashion magazine. Is or is oh, it, it was a job. That was a real job. That was a, my first actual paid job. Okay. About, out of college, yeah. And that that there's something about your book and your writing that that has um and uh, this can be construed as I don't mean this offensively, but you you're oh, it, it's kind of like a magazine, uh, the 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 tonality and the it, it, there's a there's a lightness and and a, a kind of a, a fizziness to 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 the oh, to the textuality okay. of the uh-huh. writing and and the way that that you're going about it. But I wonder if that. Um, if working in the fashion industry didn't uh, somehow hone your bullshit detector by seeing what what what's fashionable, <laughs> and, and just being able to tell yeah. what what kind of fashions are going to last, because it seems like you approach things as you're you're you're, you're really commenting on popular culture, and and so mm-hmm. you're commenting on how people are presenting, like like on the the most kind of the the shallow level of it, but right. that doesn't mean that you yourself aren't making like an actual substantive point about how it all stacks up. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's so funny. I, it's like, I did work, um, it was, it was technically, it was technically a beauty magazine. I worked at Allure magazine. So, and, and I worked at Allure magazine, uh, right when it was founded. It was, it was only founded in 1991 and I graduated from college in 1992 and I started working there that, um, so yeah, there was a lot of fashion, but like, I always say like, technically it was a magazine about skin. It was a magazine about exfoliating was, was really, uh, what it was about. Uh, so I am like the most un I don't know what kind of backdrop you're gonna have on me, but I'm literally wearing like like a sweat I'm like a not a fashionable person. I'm wearing um like a wool like well, you look cozy. Sweater. Cozy's fashionable. I, it is freezing today and the wind is like, you know, about to break the window. But uh I, I'm not a fashion person. I was like uh hired I, I was an editorial assistant and I and I worked for um an editor uh, it was actually pretty great. Like we 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 worked with a lot of um, pretty serious literary writers uh, who mm. we were commissioning to write essays. And the thing, you know, the thing with fashion magazines is they, that's where the money was. Like the glossy Condé Nast magazines, that's where you could make money as a freelancer. Um, I certainly didn't make a lot of money as an editorial assistant, but I had health insurance and it was a real job. Um, and you know, I wrote for all of those magazines in my twenties because that's where you could make a dollar, two dollars, sometimes three dollars a word. Uh, you know, not you, you couldn't get that writing for the Paris Review. You know, everybody. In fact, like you know, famously, the the best paying magazines were Cosmopolitan and Playboy. Those and Playboy had a real serious literary tradition. Um, but anyway, I, I I digress. No, I was not a fashion person. But I think what you're getting at is. Um, a sort of uh, attention to to artifice and uh, an interest in authenticity, which is I, I have just always had that. That's kind of the theme that I've been circling around as a writer my whole yeah. career. What what is authentic? Yeah. And I think that comes more from just the, the particular proclivities of of my parents and where they came from and their sort of journeys, kind of mm-hmm. socioeconomically and and otherwise. So. I don't think it comes from I don't I don't think it comes from from fashion, but you know certainly, uh, I I went to you know I, I I went to college near New York City uh, with a lot of people who were very wealthy and from New York City, and then I I moved to New York and I was surrounded by like you know there was constantly this tension between uh, what what your life really was and what you were trying to make it seem like. <laughs> Okay, and yeah, that's always, yeah. and that's always been a central in in my work. Always, always, uh, no matter yeah. what I'm. 
So when, when that's extrapolated, do you think it's fair to say that, that when you extrapolate that way of thinking from the personal or the interpersonal to the societal, that's kind of what you're diagnosing, the, the tensions between w- what is artificial and what is authentic? Yeah. In, in these yeah. various different movements? and Yes. I mean, I tend to, uh, to a fault, I think I, I tend to think that people are are acting like it's kind of a, I, I have to really like check myself for this because sometimes okay, like if somebody is being um, like very aggressive, for instance, my, my, or being just sort of like a jerk, like my, my instinct is to think that they're just faking it, that they're just like really insecure and they're pretending to be that way. And I think that might be part of the reason that I'm less, I, I get less upset about like men being misogynist or saying sexist things or just being like bullies or whatever, because I just think it's like, Oh, you're just a loser. Like I, I go right to like, you're a loser. I'm not <laughs> how you, I feel sorry for you. And that's one of the tensions I talk about in the book. But, yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, I guess it's more like, you know, I, I really don't, um, I'm very aware of, of people being being sort of separated from themselves and, and, and of cognitive dissonance generally. And that's what we have right now in the culture. And that's what the book is really about is cognitive dissonance, like the gulf between what we think and what we think we're supposed to think and what we feel and oh. what we think we're supposed to feel. And, and how do you merge those two? And I think that this, uh, that is a phenomenon that just exists in human psychology generally, but in this moment, it's manifesting all over society. Mm-hmm. In in thinking about your book and ruminating on it, I was thinking, what is a writer? Because you're very much a writer, and and I, I am too. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not this or that. Like I don't have. Just speaking for me, I, I I'm I'm a writer. What is what is the capacity of the writer? And I think what you're bringing up with artifice and the tension between artifice and authenticity is one aspect of it. Um, how do you? how do you urge people or incentivize people to, to make meaningful content? And then, mm. you know, as a writing teacher, but then also on social media, if, if you could imagine that scaling, how do you think that you could, we could, uh, you know, urge people in that direction? Yeah. I mean, I think it was a checkoff quote, like, you know, the, the job of the writer is not to solve the problem, but to identify the problem correctly. Okay. So, mm. uh, you know, I, I think sometimes we get caught up because it's like, oh, well, I can't, I can't talk about this problem that I'm observing because I don't have a solution for it. Well, no, if, if there was a solution for it, somebody would have solved it by now and it, it wouldn't be a problem and you wouldn't have noticed it. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I really want people, and I, and I do this with my students all the time, like I, I want them to just really sit with themselves and ask themselves, what they really think like what is it like what is the thing that that you can't that that you know to be true but for whatever reason you Hmm. don't want to say or you think people you you think people will disagree with you you know i often do like a prompt where i say like finish the sentence like um i know this probably won't win me a lot of friends but i really have to say blank and then they go from there and hmm. uh, it turns up a lot of a lot of interesting things, you know. I I, I think the job of the writer is to um, is is to say the things that that you suspect a lot of people are thinking and feeling, but they are either afraid to say out loud, or they can't articulate it, or they can't quite figure it out. Like that that's your job. And hmm. and again, that has always been the job, and it still is my job in my mind. But that very impulse is uh discouraged now (laughs) and it's like completely counter to the job Mm. of being a writer and Mm. it just blows my mind i mean editors don't want you to do it (laughs) yeah well i mean now there's sensitivity readers that actively go along and silence you yeah 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 and and i think you know and i i talk about this a lot i feel so lucky that i came of age as a writer before social media. I mean, there was barely internet. So, you know, I started writing controversial pieces in the mid nineties and uh, people would get mad, but that would mean that they would write angry letters to the editor and maybe, and maybe the publication would print a few of them and I would see them six weeks later. And in the meantime, I would be on to the next assignment. And in fact, like getting a, getting a response from readers, um, 
po- ideally positively and negatively, that was considered a success. The editor would say, oh, great, let's okay. hire her to do another piece. Like, she's on to the okay. next thing. That was the job. Okay. And now it's sort of like if you get um, – if, if you get that kind of response, it's like, oh, no, that's that's going to be blowback. And that's not what we want. But that's because it's take it's not just letters to the editor. It's it's not even just comments anymore. It's it's yeah. tweet. And and the idea that, like, you know, a, campaigns, a tw- 12, and, uh, people, you know, 12 people having um, a, 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 a negative reaction that includes calling you a bigot uh, can shut you down. And that just would never have happened before. That would never have happened when I was in my 20s writing controversial pieces. And frankly, if it had happened, I don't think I would be the kind of writer that I am. And and okay. I really feel for people trying to get started today because you're like, you're, you're, you're censored before, you know, you're, you're censoring yourself. I'm not saying, you know, nobody's being literally censored, okay. but it's very, very hard to get past that. How do you think that people should be able to shrug that off or like interact with that negative, that, that very focused negative attention? That I mean, I don't know. What do you think? It's really, I, I have, I don't want to be glib about it because it's easy mm. for me to sit here and say like, well, screw them. But if, if they, I mean, I have students who tell me that they don't even want to bring stuff into class, like forget being published. They don't want to bring something into a class to be discussed because they're afraid somebody will be so offended by it that they'll be like ostracized socially within the school environment. I mean, you're younger than I am. What do you think? I honestly don't know how to answer that question. (laughs) I'd love to hear yours or anyone's thoughts. Well, I just I wonder if uh, if if there's the value of offendedness is overinflated right now, and there'll eventually be a, a bubble, uh, yes. you know, kind of an economic bubble on the yes, social we're world. in the offensive in the offensiveness bubble. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's irrational exuberance. It's it's irrational outrage. Yeah, <laughs> but so but I but it's like I don't know. I, you can't. It, it's not just a matter of telling people to step away from Twitter. I mean, yeah, that would help, yeah. but um, well, you have to participate in the world. You can't run to a mountain retreat. That's where the attention is. And if you're going to be a writer, your your main, um, I guess, the the medium that you're actually working in is not language. It's attention. It's always been other people and and that that convergence of attention on, on what you write or what you put out there. Right. So you can't, I guess you can Salinger it and have somebody like print it in five years from now and stuff. But yeah, if you have the compulsion to speak, you, you have to speak. And so there there's, that comes with a, a cost right now, but maybe, maybe that, that, that'll change if the right words. I, I have, I agree. I, I, re- I think that people are getting sick of it. I would also say like, Think, think hard about what what the stakes really are. Like people yelling at you on Twitter, mm-hmm. not going to kill you. Like you know, getting fired because people are yelling at you on Twitter. Yes, that's that's a serious thing. But if it's really a matter of like people are calling you a jerk, uh, people are you know threatening you, quote unquote. Is that really going to kill you? I mean, there is this idea. I, you know, people always say, oh, I get death threats every day. I, I get threatened on Twitter. Like, what does that mean? I, I, I would, on, I, I ask this in all sincerity. I, I would like to know what those death threats look like. I have never gotten one. I was a newspaper columnist for 12 years. I had like, you know, hmm. like tea par- you know, right wingers writing to me all the time saying horrible things to me. I, I don't consider die bitch to be a mm-hmm. death threat. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't. So mm. I, I think that it's very easy to like over, and I don't want to diminish it. Like I I fully believe that people have gotten legitimate death threats, especially you know people in marginalized groups. All of that, a hundred percent. But I do think that there is a little bit of a of a sort of you know default position. There's a little bit of like a like a social contagion when it comes around even very online to say, oh, I've been threatened all the time. I'm in danger yeah, all yeah. the time. Not all those people are. Most well, of them like are not. We, what we began speaking about towards the beginning about being obvious. Like, not only is their first uh, move obvious, but then when they get that 
big blowback reaction. I've seen it over and over and over again. Like, oh, all, like say, okay, just for an example, say something about all white men being like, you know, the worst thing in the world. And then a bunch of white men come up to defend yeah. themselves and they say, oh, look at all the white men, like right. now, like being the worst thing in the world. Like it, it's just like every well, it's just step of that. Privacy. You've weaponized. Yeah. yeah I mean, you've well, created even a, your own it's enemy. It's a script. Yeah. Right. Right. I know. Sort of like if you go on a hike, with you know, if you say bears attack, and then you go on a hike with meat in your pockets, <laughs> and a bear attacks you, I guess you're right. I guess hmm. bears are bad, and we and all bears are bad. Well, at that point, it's just performance bears. art, right? <laughs> you know, again, the rewards for that are great. Like I, I and I don't. Um, that I still. I, I still ask myself, like, what are we getting out of it? Like, what what are you getting out, out of it other than just like a very, uh, you know, a, a shallow validation? Um, well, how do we rescue empathy then from the uh, abuses of social justice justice rhetoric? I, I, you know, I would I want to know what empathy even means anymore. I mean, one of the things mm. that I've been accused of is um, is like abandoning empathy. I, I get I, I get accused of having no empathy anymore, which That's is rather very melodramatic. Strange because the book is so you know, this actually this is my the sixth book I've published. It's it's the most careful, most bending over backwards, most just accommodating hedging. You know, the book okay. yeah, it does it hedges too much actually. And I, I shouldn't have because I was not gonna win these people over anyway. Like I, I really I, I should have gone harder, but like the book is a self interrogation. I'm I'm constantly wrestling on every single page, and to me that comes out of out of empathy. I mean, I am not interested in saying like, you know, millennials, you're all a bunch of snowflakes. Like, a that's obvious. It's basic. It's not interesting, <laughs> and it's not true. So it's just mm. it's strange that. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, anything other than sort of like following the quote unquote empathy script will then get you placed in the lack of empathy bucket. You know, it's funny because like the the New Yorker review, um, which, by the way, you know, probably sold a lot of books. Like I got a lot of people who are suddenly extremely interested in the book because of this very negative review. But, you know, in the book, I'm I'm wrestling with myself. Like I'm saying, like, what am I missing about, you know, this younger generation? Am I just not getting it? Am I just doing some version of get off my lawn? Like, you know, what is it? And the headline of the um, of the New York review was Megan Dom says to millennials, get off my lawn. (laughs) The headline. I saw another headline um, because I talk about uh I talk about, you know, I'm very Gen X. I talk about Alanis Morissette a bit in the book. And another headline of the review was um, Jagged Little Red Pill. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, nice. That's actually kind of clever. It's a great headline. But, you know, again, I, I make a very big point in the book, you know, is this red pilling? It's not. It's an assortment of pills. I literally yeah. say in the book, like, this is not red yeah. pilling. It's an assortment of pills. And then I go on and on and on. And... Like, I get it. It's a clever headline, but it's not what the book is at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess we just we just have to, you know, choose. Do you no, want the headline I, or do you want an accurate uh, article? I, one of the difficult things being a, a public persona, um, which I, I'm totally grateful for YouTube al- allowing me to do this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things that is amazing is the amount of live feedback. I'm constantly getting comments. I'm constantly interacting with the audience. And one thing that I've, I've had to develop is uh, an ability to take criticism at its own value and know when to say that that, that doesn't matter. And and constantly, right. over and over and over again, I will I will explicitly say this is not what I'm saying, or I'm not making a general statement. Yes. I'm I'm, say, I'm, sp- I'm talking about my personal experience. I'm not making a statement, or I will I will I will section off like this is not what I mean. And for I some reason, they 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 just say exactly what I said I wasn't right. doing. They ca- they Kathy Newman you, <laughs> right? They do the cat. So what you're saying is. Yeah, yeah, I know. I feel like there should be like a like there should be some macro keys. Like you should be able to be like you know mm. control seven, and it would say like to be sure, sexual assault is a very very serious crime that should be not diminished, and we should all give survivors the benefit of the doubt. 
that said, and then make your point. <laughs> like, huh. do we, are we really, it's like the sort of Trump thing. Like Trump is very, 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 very bad. And now I'm going to say what I really have to say. Like, are we, are, do we really huh. have to keep going through these catechisms of, you know, mm. the to be sure paragraph. That's what they call it in opinion writing, the to be sure paragraph, which is like, oh, you know, okay. you open your, you have your opening gambit. Uh, you, you taught you, you know, summarize the event that you're going to be commenting on. Um, and then you say, uh, you start to say your opinion. And then there's a paragraph that, you know, where you say effectively, to be sure, there are all sorts of people who would think differently. They might say this, they might say this, they might say this. And so you inoculate yourself against that criticism. And then you go, that said, I still think blah, blah, blah. And that used to be one paragraph, like the to be sure uh. paragraph, was one paragraph. And now it's like two thirds of the piece. <laughs> The whole thing is like a to, a to be sure check, a privilege check. Um, and hmm. are, are we really all, uh, do we have such amnesia? Does every writer read, does every reader have such amnesia uh, that they yeah. need to be reminded that the writer uh, is not a terrible person? I, that's pretty insulting it, to readers. It, for some reason it brings to mind, I don't know why it brings to mind, but there's this passage in the Gulag Archipelagio where the, it talks about Stalin giving a speech and then everybody claps at the end of the speech. And it's like you have to, the last person, the first person to stop apologizing is going to get the bullet. You know, everybody's just apologizing, 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 apologizing. And, and I just, I don't know what, how did this culture of, you know, uh, collective coercion uh become viable I, I i i know it's a number of different things and i've already asked you and you've already answered it so much but it just seems like it's not fun it's it's gonna run right. out of juice it's just not fun like w- i i had to you know there are people who have studied this in a serious yeah. way i mean you can talk to jonathan Haidt about it you can talk to um gene twenge about it i mean there are people who have really yeah. looked at the, at the psychological um challenges you know of of these generations coming up and i i think that there's a look i think it's i think it's really really hard to to be in the world now i mean i think uh, you know if if you're a teenager and and all you know is social media and you know like jonathan height we'll talk about this it used to be that you'd get bullied in the schoolyard and then you'd go home and the bullying would be over now it's happening online it's happening on on instagram it's happening on social media it never ends you're constantly measuring yourself against, you know, yeah. Instagram filters and, and celebrities. And um, mm. I think it, you know, the amount of sort of psychological trauma and uh, emotional distress and mental illness, however you want to define it, um, is, is stratospheric. And so, you know, mm. I, I, I'm very mindful of uh, the, the, the things that, that, younger people have to deal with that I didn't have to. I mean, I, I, I talk about this, you know, the whole thing around sexual consent that I, I feel like as a Gen X person, it's none of my business how like a Gen, a, a millennial or a Gen Z person wants to handle that because they're dealing with a whole different set of conditions. They're, they grew up with mm-hmm. ubiquitous online pornography. Their expectations for sexual encounters are very different than what I had to deal with and what baby boomers had to deal with. It's like, it's, it's really, really different. So I just think that, um, I think it's hard to be, I think it's really hard to deal with life these days. Ironically, it's because of social media that it's hard to deal with life, but then you turn to social media as a coping Mm -hmm. mechanism and all these like terrible, uh, terrible Mm -hmm. things come out of it. You, you behave badly you have group psychology that becomes mob mentality. You gang up on people. So it's really like, it's, it's really a self-fulfilling prophecy. But um, I, I hope that, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not sustainable. I mean, I think that's clear. It's like, yeah. you know, eventually everybody will be canceled and maybe we can just hit a reset. You know? <laughs> what what's the uh, what's one, one or two topics that uh, you shouldn't be talking about that you really want to talk about? coming up here oh are you focusing on the election or is there what's the most dangerous uh, thing that you, you i want to talk about, about greta thunberg i want to talk about greta thunberg but oh. i'm not i'm i'm formulating my thoughts about her okay yeah um doesn't I, she have an arch nemesis like they're gonna 
two 16 year olds are going to duke it out. Okay, And I don't know much about. Yeah. So there's some like um, slightly older right wing blonde teenage girl who's like the anti Greta. I don't know if she's a climate change denier. See, And this is this is exactly the problem here. So Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, is uh, in my opinion, you know, she's she's on the autism spectrum, as is her sister, as is her mother. Uh, Mm. It's in their book. I'm not making this up. They talk about it openly. Um, A lot of a lot of psychological distress, um, OCD, uh, really, really difficult uh, time in childhood, both her and her sister. And it got she she got uh, onto the climate change thing. And it was a way to wrap this uh, this particular psychology. It was a way to sort of organize I, I'm, the patholo- I'm not using the word pathology in a pejorative way, but it was a way to sort of organize her distress and channel it into something that uh, could have is it's the red is theoretically productive. But I mean, it's 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 amazing to me that uh, we have this you know enormous global thought leader in a 13 year old girl who is um, deeply traumatized and is traumatizing other children now. <laughs> With, with by by telling them that the world is going to end yeah. and I, again i don't i want to be careful how i talk about this because it sounds really reductive and it's it's really complicated so uh i don't want to say too much because i'm still thinking about this but yeah but it's the fact that we you know because because somebody like greta is so extreme we wind up with somebody on the right who's so extreme. Like there, there needs to be something in the middle. Like the fact that this person on on the right, the anti Greta emerged, is a testament to uh, how insufficient <laughs> the Greta phenomenon herself is, and and you know how easily it's going to go, it's going to go sideways. And and I don't, I I I, I do think. Uh, I, I do think she's being used by the adults around her. I mean, I, I'm not, I am not criticizing her in and of herself. She's a child. Like she's mm-hmm. obviously very bright and she has convictions and it's, that is all fine. But the, the phenomenon around her, yeah. uh, I think is deeply troubling, deeply, deeply troubling. There's uh there's something, I don't want to be reductive either, but there, there's that aphorism or catchism about the personal is the political. Yeah. And once that becomes instituted, then, then the psychosis becomes social. Like it, it scales up all of the right. personal baggage, projects it onto the world. And then it becomes a, it becomes a worldview. It becomes something that is in and of itself a psychosis. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. The personal is political. I mean, that came out of a, there was an essay it was by a woman named Carol Hamish actually coined that phrase. And she wrote it She in the early seventies. Uh, she wrote uh, an essay for this sort of compilation of uh, second wave feminist writing. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what her piece was about. It was, and I, 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 I had, I, I, this was something that had originally been in my book that I ended up taking out for some reason. But, mm. but anyway, that doesn't matter. The, the personal is political was coined by, the second wave feminist in, in the early seventies, or maybe I'm sure somebody said it before then, but she sort of got it, got it going. And yeah, like it's one of those things where it's like, well, what does it really mean? It's, it's, I think you put it very well just now, but it's also sort of way of saying like, you know, it, th- there's, there's a uh, nobility and narcissism. <laughs> like, mm. okay. Like the, you know, the personal is political. So, so if I just have like a, a, a particular, neuroses um i i can wrap it around some uh, some larger cause and and have it be okay that i haven't dealt with my neuroses yeah in, in, in an odd way that actually makes in an odd way that doing that makes your activism more authentic than a virtue signal because you're it, it turns it well, into a larping true. thing but it's got real weight because you really are expressing true distress yeah Probably in a yeah, I, I would argue. Well, right. Way, there's, but. there's nothing less authentic than a virtue signal. So that that's like yeah. on the on the low the low low end. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, activism it's it's a funny thing because it's it's crucial that we have activists. I mean, the history of our country is, you know, mm-hmm. activism is the backbone of of American of democracy. Like, you know, that's hmm. I think that's a fair statement. Um, but activism. 
is different than um, than uh, it's it's di it's different than uh, sort of it, it's not an intellectual pursuit. It's not no. I don't think that you can sort of um, engage in like a ton of critical thinking and really wrestle with your cognitive dissonance and also be an activist. Um, I, 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 or, or at least not um, hmm. the kind of activist that's going to get the most attention. Now, that's not to say that, like, you know, Martin Luther King uh, didn't wrestle with cognitive dissonance or wasn't a critical thinker or, or a, a deeply intelligent person. I just think that there is mm -hmm. a sort of, um, in, in order, you know, especially the state of activism now is that you really, it is a sort of like the, the, the messaging is very clear, it's very precise. Uh, you know, there's there's not a there's not a lot of room for for nuance. I think that's why the Me Too discussion is is so mm. fascinating and complicated because you want to have activism around it, but mm. it's almost like a movement that uh, that it, it sort of precludes activism in a way because it it, it necessitates uh, really looking at things on a case by case basis. I mean, you you yeah. have to. Uh, and so I think what we're trying to do in some cases is, is apply an activist uh, model to something mm. that is perhaps uh, resistant to that. In your in your work, which is an art, have you had to like kind of struggle between like I, I don't know how to make this an interesting question, but like how do you be an activist and how do you be an artful activist? How do you be? I, I keep on having this vision of you in my head of like you would be the person if you were being brainwashed that you would constantly just move your chair like one inch just like to keep just to keep like <laughs> one tiny bit of volition. It seems uh -huh. like you're always you're you're the kind of person that would always like resist even resistance. You would you would always have to have a little bit of, you know, little contrarian twist. Uh -huh. All uh -huh. the time. How do you maintain like I need to do something for my society, but at the same time, uh, I'm. And this is a particular. Yeah. I, I I I felt this. One one of the things that really resonated with your with your book was that I felt like a lot of my Gen X ness in there, and it's like this kind of ironic reality bites. Uh, not too cool for school, but I, I'm not going to fight the patriarchy. I'm fighting reality. You know, like right. like this yeah. kind of. Um, well, I am not an activist. Uh, yeah. Are you know. called to do that? Or are you called to as a um, liberal? As well, a, I as don't a think anybody wants democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, there's certainly things I I care about a lot. I mean, I've been involved. Yeah. I, I I've done I, I do volunteer work. I really um, I I okay. I feel very you know strongly about my, my community. I mean, it's interesting. I guess I don't. Um, the, okay. when, when, the, when, where I want to like you know the, the ways I do volunteer work, I've actually been. It has nothing to do with, with politics. Like I, I I've written about this in the past. This is not a secret. But like I was I was involved in the foster care system. I was a court appointed special advocate in the L.A. County uh, foster care system, and that's a whole. There's a core of volunteers basically kind of functions as like uh, unofficial social workers in, in a way. And it's, it, you're really deep into the system and you're really, you're dealing with um, incredibly brutal cases. And uh, it's, mm. and, and, and I actually loved doing it because it completely transcended politics. I mean, it had, you had situations where somebody who was like a, you know, right wing Christian evangelist was fighting for the same thing as like you know a super progressive LGBT person. You know they're they're all they're all in it together. It's like it's it has nothing. I mean there are political elements, but it's completely separate. So that's where I like to do my work because it yeah. just doesn't have anything. It doesn't sort of like bleed over into this part of my brain that is okay constantly looking at the, at, the, at the gigantic picture. So anyway, yeah, but. I mean, I did go to the women's march. I did. I mean, not the fir not the first one, but I I went to the to the second one because I was. I guess the, that, that's what I was. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that that seems like one method of uh, correcting our society. Uh, everybody, kind of put your money where your mouth is, or like if if you want to be for justice, like what are you actually doing in the world? Like you know, like if <laughs> if you do really care about the world, then your work has to, you know, bleed out of the conversation. So I, I just wonder if, if there's, if that, that kind of private. I mean, the thing is, if you really, you know, if you care, 
who, everybody cares about justice. Like, it's important, especially like, how are you defining it? I mean, if, if any, if you take any issue and you scratch beneath the surface, it's so much more complicated than this. Just like this side is good. This side is bad. It's like, you know, I mm. could, you know, you, you could say like, oh, uh, kids in foster care. Um, it's, it's terrible that, uh, that they, uh, you know, that, that, that they're separated from their families under this or under this condition. And like, you know, it's, it's automatically terrible that certain decisions are being made. Once you get in there, you're seeing mm. like decisions are being made for a whole bunch of reasons that never occurred to you. And, and what's going on, uh, is run completely counter to what you assume. And so I think the thing is like, it's very easy to know what side you're on when you're not like deeply involved in it. You know, you can't, it's like, it's something like immigration is so, so, so fraught, but like caring about immigrants, uh, means that there needs to be some sort of coherent immigration policy. <laughs> Otherwise you're really not helping anybody. Um, and so that, why is that? But, it, but for an activist to even start to go to those places is very dangerous because you're getting off of the, the narrative. You know. Okay, so right. so the the climate of activism, well, the climate of a specific sort of very loud online, very online activism is actually not even almost not activism or, or not allowing uh, real change in the world to happen because the right. script, the map, and the territory are right. Yeah, how can you? Have, I mean, you can't, I mean in, in a lot for a lot of these issues you can't start to address them until you're honest about what is occurring, why is it occurring, under what circumstances it is occurring. Uh, something like, you know, trans rights. So you can say uh, trans people are being murdered. Trans people are dying all the time. Like, you know, therefore we need to approach uh, trans activism in this way. Well, why are who what trans people are dying under what circumstances what is the reason um once you start asking those questions people get real uncomfortable hmm. because it doesn't line up with their narrative and it's really unfortunate because if you want to stop trans people from dying we need to actually be honest about why they're dying and then take steps to keep that from happening and hmm. if it's not a hate crime necessarily if it's because they're more likely to be involved in sex work or uh, drugs or whatever it is. Uh, we need to acknowledge that and then take steps to, to fix it. So, you know, the fact that it's not necessarily 100% a hate crime uh, doesn't mean that it's still not important. We can't talk about it. But, like, <laughs> sorry. It's, it, and, again, like, this is what Eric Weinstein says. It's like, well, you know, when you're ready to sit at the grown-up table... And have mm. these conversations. Let let me know. And it's you would think mm. that it would be so obvious, but people get really really scared um, once you start going into anything that like might even like have the tiniest tiniest whiff of mm. uh, bigotry. And it's it's not at all. It's it's mm. it's pragmatism and I think respect for people's actual needs and actual experience. Mm. Are, do you have any uh, projects coming up or um, uh, speaking tours or? Uh, <laughs> um, well, new book or I, I'm all, a new book. I, I mean, I'm always kind of out and about talking about this. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of um, I'm, 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 I'm brainstorming about sort of ways mm. to kind of like facilitate these conversations. It's it was pretty it was pretty profound to me to be on book tour and and just see the gulf between the way the ideas in my book and in books like it. And then, you know, not, not just me, but the sort of people like us in this sphere, um, there's a way that the ideas that we have are metabolized in the, mm. in the mm. media sphere. And there are ways that they're being metabolized by like real people on the ground and the real people on the ground are actually, you know, much more eager to have that conversation. They do want to talk about why trans mm. people are dying they do want to talk about it and they want to, because they actually uh, know trans people or their kids are trans and they want to know what to do and they want to really know how to handle it. And it's like that conversation is not for some reason allowed to be had hmm. on NPR, <laughs> but it's being had on the ground. And so I'm trying to sort of think about ways to maybe harness the, the energy of 
the people who really want to talk about things. But I have no idea how to do that. I'm, it's mm. very much uh, there's there's lots of different options. Are you thinking like media or like a like a, a book group or discussion group? Are you thinking about something on, online or recorded sort of or both. You... maybe some combination of both? I I, oh. I I honestly I honestly don't know. Um, I'm I'm just right now I'm just sort of like trying to t- hear from people what what they think they need. Like if they think that. Okay this if the opportunity to talk about these things is missing in their real life in their real communities um then that would be something potentially to to facilitate but um you know i i i just like to talk to people so so (laughs) congratulations for reaching the end of the podcast if you enjoyed this product consider donating to this channel via paypal.me slash benjamin boyce or joining me on patreon also follow me on twitter at Benjamin A. Boyce. Have a good night.